Hello, everybody. Welcome to this really important panel on denim and segregation in the industry. My name is Amy Leverton. Um, I'm the founder of Denim Dudes. And I wanted to introduce the topic of this conversation and my amazing panelists. But I first wanted to kind of outline how and why this conversation came about in the first place. Um, back in June, I got a DM from an amazing woman called Morgan Elise, who I'm hoping is watching. Hi, Morgan, if you're watching. So she had some passionate words that she wanted to share with me. And I'm going to read her words out because she put it so well. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't better it myself. She said, despite its great legacy within fashion, streetwear is often met with disdain making it very hard for those who worked at Aniche, Fubu, Fat Farm, Rockaway, etc., to find work. Some having to go as far as removing these companies from their resumes. As a young designer, she was saddened to find this out as these are the brands um, and the reason why she works in denim today. So I think we all remember that eureka moment when we realized oh, I could work in fashion <clears throat> and I'm inspired by these brands. And, it got me thinking, how is it that this group of brands can be important enough to inspire young creatives to get into fashion in the first place, yet are not respected enough? So the industry doesn't even support the talent that they inspire. Um, and the fact that brand name could actually be detrimental to a young designer's career is really upsetting. So we're gonna roll out a few of these Zoom conversations over the next few weeks because my conversations with Morgan and then with everyone that you'll see here um, and other in industry professionals um, really opened a can of worms and a Pandora's box uh, that can't really be covered in one shot. So further down the line, we're gonna hold conversations um, with some of the design talent who've been turned away from big brands because of their resumes. We're also gonna to explore topics such as the historical associations between what we've revered as heritage and its links with uh, race-related atrocities in the past. So lots of big subjects to come. But today, I managed to reel in some pretty amazing big names, some founders and some originators who were there at the very beginning. Um, the word architect comes up again and again in this industry. Um, these pioneers were literally building something from the ground up, not based on past sales or existing trends or an archival heritage look. Um, we're so lucky to be able to tap into these original voices today. So thank you everybody for coming. I'm gonna introduce you all one by one. I hope you, I do you all justice. So here goes, first up. The first person I called after talking to Morgan, Ali Asher Workamore, uh, he has been an invaluable friend to me in learning about the street and skate scene in the US. Um, his resume is like a who's who of the brands back in the day. Um, he founded Fat Farm, Alpha Numeric, Fiber Ops, and held senior positions at Jaws and Dub. Um, more recently, Ali launched a cool as fuck denim brand called The Teenaged, and that's where we first met in person. Um, and I think I've said this many times with different people, but maybe not directly to him, but Ali's like this true legend that has cult status within our industry, but somehow the cult status still doesn't do his work justice. So welcome, Ali. Um, it's amazing to have you. It's such an honor. Um, okay, next up, Ali's amazing connections led me straight into the arms of Bobby Joseph. Welcome, Bobby. Um, Bobby was an integral part of FUBU from 1998 to 2003, creating and growing the platinum sub-brand in um, up to about 200 million plus. Um, his influence behind the scenes of the apparel industry is both pioneering and accomplished. Uh, with his creative direction and brand strategy, not only driving a lot of the streetwear seen back in the day, but also influencing clients from LVMH to Nike to the New York Yan um, New York kids, Knicks, Knicks. <laughs> oh, I said Yankees. Terrible. Um, and he's recently launched his own namesake label as well, which you should check out. Um, okay. Then I hit up the man, the legend, Don Harrell, I think. Uh, his um, career started at Nike. I think at the moment he's literally labelled as me. Um, <laughs> his, no, no, it changed. Sorry. It's changed, thank goodness. Um, so uh, Don Juan started his career at Nike, but since 1999 he has been front and centre of the streetwear and denim world, founding two major names in each field, academics and PRPS. 
uh, I think we can all agree that Dongwan's influence and expertise has shaped the apparel world over the last two decades. Um, I would say also that every single person that I talked to was like, you've got to get Dongwan, you've got to get Dongwan. So Dongwan, thank, oh, thank you, you so, thank you. so much for no joining. Problem. <laughs> all right, April Walker, someone who I actually don't have the pleasure of knowing personally, or I think I would actually be too intimidated to, to actually speak to you one-on-one, -on -one, April. You're amazing. You're a true legend and role model to women, especially in this industry. Um, April has been in the fashion game since 1986 and started her first, uh, well, her first lifestyle urban brand, Walkerwear, in now it's at 1990, right? You, you, you coined it um, and trademarked it in 92, but it was going since 1990. Um, her work in the industry as a designer, an entrepreneur, an educator, a disruptor, and a brand evangelist has gained her legendary status. In recent years, she's relaunched her namesake brand and then also created the April Walt Walker Scholarship Grant in conjunction with Parsons and Yellow Brick Learning. So she's giving back to the young community of creatives all the time. And then last but not least, I was stoked to reel TJ Walker into this conversation. I don't know if you guys remember the first time that you saw a pair of cross-colour jeans, but I certainly do. Um, growing up in the English countryside, cross-colours didn't get onto my radar until probably 2000. Um, over a decade after they were designed. Um, yeah, I, re I think it was probably a Google image search on co color block jeans, right? Something like that. And I was just, my mind was blown. It was so fresh and different even, you know, 10 years after the fact. Um, Cross Colors design definitely grabs your attention, but the brand uh, founded with his partner, Carl Jones, was not just groundbreaking design-wise, but built on disruption and revolution pushing socio-political messaging and promoting positivity around African-American culture as well. Um, TJ is also a professor at FIDM and a public spe speaker, so continues to inspire and, and empower young brands and entrepreneurs today. Now, on to my moderator um, and new best friends, uh, and then I promise I will shut up. Um, I was encouraged to speak to Simone through Morgan, again, the official curator of this talk. And uh, we've probably been on the phone for five, six hours since that last call. Um, she's taught me so much about the brands back then, but also about the true struggle being a person of color in this industry. Um, Simone has an encyclopedic knowledge of the streetwear industry in America. Um, she's been a key, key player and enthusiast for many years. She was VP of design at Rockaware and director of merchandising at Public School NYC. Uh, her strong stance on the subject of people of color's creative con contribution to American culture makes her the perfect moderator for this conversation. And she's gonna push it, you guys. She's, she's gonna be tough. Um, but based on our many conversations, she's definitely gonna flip the role a little bit between moderator and panelist because she has a lot to say and I want you to learn as much from her as I have. Um, I'm going to field questions from the audience. Feel free to put them in the Q&A section below. Try not to use chat. It's just easier for us to get a handle on. Um, but for now, I'm going to shut the hell up and hand it over to Simone to kick this conversation off. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that, Amy. One, I actually would prefer the panel just to speak because what we're looking at here is the true cultural pioneers of a total fashion movement. These are the visionaries and the creatives that spot trends that have been chased for the last 25 years. Chased, duplicated, copied. I mean, without them, there is no streetwear industry as we know it today. And for me, I do take this personally because I have literally watched such creative people that from zero to billions of dollars this industry was and their talent is not recognized because of the color of their skin and the color of their resume. So this is going to be a very honest conversation about the systematic racism and biases that exists in denim streetwear fashion. I am truly humbled just to be in your presence, real talk. And I really want to look at why black fashion urban is labeled, stereotyped, dismissed. It was streetwear. It's in its essence, it is streetwear. So for me, my first question to the panelists, and you can answer as, when there seems to be this narrative that when it's black brands, 
black culture, it's only for black people. But when it's white brands, black culture, it's for everyone. And this black fashion, we never hear it called white fashion. So why is it okay to constantly stereotype and kind of put us all in this lump? And why do you think that narrative exists? Or do you think that narrative exists? Where does it come from? Go, April. I say that it's a microcosm for what exists in our, in our world right now, you know, the fashion industry. When I think about what you just said, I think about why do we have a multicultural division when it comes to advertising versus just advertising dollars? You know, there's so many like <laughs> code names for marketing to us, for us, but not by us. Um, that that's why that problem exists. It's called creative looting. I think there's a lot of creative looting that's always going on in the fashion industry. And it becomes mainstream when someone that doesn't look like us makes the things that we're making, then it's, then it's like for everyone. So I agree with you, but I think the problem is systematic and it's, uh, we create a cultural ecosystem, a thriving cultural ecosystem that we don't participate in, in terms of the equity, in terms of the ownership, and in terms of the legacy uh, stories. But that is because the, the fashion game is rigged from the door, you know, with, with discriminatory practices, with invisible challenges, and with... Um, with a blind eye on purpose. So if anyone else wants to comment in before I ask the next one. Well, I, uh, I, I just want to say, I think that, you know, the, the minds that, uh, of, you know, if it's for, you know, if, if someone black does something, you know, it's a certain, you know, um, type of style, or a certain type of look or a certain type of perception is associated with that. But I think that, you know, I, I, I'm from Mississippi and, you know, from the South. So, uh, and a little little bit older than some of you on the panel. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think just in terms of the, I, I'm just gonna say as far as the US and I know as far as the South, there was always the thing of segregation. You know, they're separate but equal in terms of that. And I think that mentality is just something that's kind of ingrained into, you know, the US uh, is particularly in terms of how things are perceived or looked at. And so I think that just kind of mentally kind of puts it in a separate box. When people think about anything that's done by someone black and anything done by someone that's white. Uh, and I just think that's just kind of a mindset. And I think that's something we need to get away from or try to get, uh, you know, try to grow out of. And I think that's happening, but definitely I think that's where it kind of stems from a lot of that. So the bias that exists is really a bigger picture. So even okay. though we're in fashion and we're creative and we see things that don't exist and actually are able to put them into realness, we still seem to be looped in that larger systematic issues where we only see things as one way because this is the way it's always kind of been. So when we look at the 90s and 2000 and streetwear, it was very diverse. It wasn't this monolithic concept. Each one of your, your brands that you worked on were very separate. They had their own identities. But as the industry got bigger and bigger, it seemed that everything just started to kind of lump into one. So where Aliash came from state and street and academics wasn't really hip hop and FUBU was a very different brand, all of a sudden the labels of urban hip hop, black fashion started kind of, and you saw even in magic, everyone started squeezing into one little pocket. Why do you think that we are not able to be seen as not all the same and allow our diversity to be shown more and to be accepted like when you look at, and I'm just using it, white fashion, there's all different levels. They're all different just because they're brands that are associated with it rock, they don't get lumped into they're just this. Why is that conversation of we're just this continue to happen? There, there, <clears throat> there's a, 
there's another consideration that I think everybody should be mindful of, and that's the business of it, right? So uh, let's go back to let's go back to merry-go-round and cross colors, or fast forward to Fat Farm, Academics, Fubu. Uh, so merry-go-round and cross colors. That's like 1990, 91 ish, somewhere in there. Fast forward 2001, Federated Brands, right? So those two, those two uh, mega companies, they had gatekeepers, right? And the and the gatekeepers uh, were motivated to keep silos, right? So you know it's 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 easier to um, to purchase and plan when you you know that this consumer base is coming in your store for that. So I, I, I really understand the conversation of systemic racism and, and uh, obstacles and being black and blah, 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 blah. But there, there's also a business side of it um, that it was just easier. It was just easier for the buyers to do that. And over time, it snowballed into something that wasn't beneficial to most of us in our careers at a later date. Um, oh, yeah, she had something to say. Yeah, I kind of want to add on to something Bobby said. So kind of the root of the conversation in general is that racism stems from resources and economics. That's what, so the business of, you know, this conversation comes from the, uh, economics so if you're a salesperson and you've been in this industry for so long and then this new burgeoning thing is happening and there's all these like black folks or people of color doing this thing and you're uh, a white buyer or a jimmy jazz kind of a guy um you know that running this this thing and you don't want to take the time to understand what's going on you have to create a box right you're not worried about looking for nuance you're just like oh it's all brown people so i'm going to call it urban it doesn't matter if it's like skateboarding or snowboarding or hip-hop or denim or you know it could be it could be a bunch of black skydivers it doesn't matter they're going to put it in one place and call it urban which is code word for black because they're going to it's an assumptive box um, and it's a lazy, racist box because it's just an easy way to put us all in the same place to sell stuff back to us, which is even crazier. Um, done. <laughs> you know, I would actually agree with uh, Bobby about the economic standpoint because it was easy to typecast us as a group of people, even though we're all individual designers, to be put in this one box of style and uh, to try to break out that box was always very difficult for us because we're always typecast once uh, the, the enormous impact of urban street, hip hop, whatever the case you may wanna call it. But uh, ever since then, it's been very difficult to, to break out of that box after that typecasting. But it was definitely more uh, based on economics more than anything else. It was easy to just kind of say, okay, well, we're gonna go buy this from this group of people today, whereas everything else is separate. You know, this is just what I've seen over the years. And, and for the most part, and for the most part of, uh, of like that consumer base from age 15 to 30-ish, right, during those periods of time, they weren't looking for, a, a chunk, a, a vast majority weren't looking for brands in those stores that like, remember, remember Bad Boy, the, the surf brand, or Billabong, or OP, or, uh, brands that catered more towards uh, a, a, a young men's white audience, the, the black consumer wasn't looking for that. They were looking for something that was, um, that spoke to aspiration, that spoke to um, uh, the connection to hip hop music, which is, we, 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 we could go on, we could do a documentary for uh, a year about the influence of hip hop music and culture, right? So, um, so in part, it was easy. And, and be mindful of the snowball effect. Over time, if you keep saying things over time, over time, over time, it loses its meaning, right? 
and and it morphs into something else, usually nefarious, right? So, I, where where it started off, if, if you would have said urban in uh, 1988, it it wouldn't have been a curse word. Well, it, urban it, was Prada. Prada used to call itself urban when they came out with the red label. It was it was urban, and that was at the same time. So the question is for me. Why is it when it's black creatives, does it become a bad word? When someone else uses it, it's okay. So when you're looking now at like the Neo streetwear, as streetwear has grown, as you created a foundation and now it's built up, it's now predominantly a space created with white and Asian faces. You don't see as many people of color. Sorry, April, go. Which I think you're off. You're you muted, April. Me. Because when you control the narrative, you control the story and you control the outcome. And I think that when you can have that kind of narrative and power from a distribution standpoint, you stay in control. And until we are fully vertical, that's the relationship, you know. And I think things are changing, but, you know, just as Bobby and some other people have said from the business standpoint, I agree, but the problem with it is we're not afforded the same resources, the same factoring opportunities, the same banking propositions. I've seen at Super Show one basketball company that happened to be black owned that was out of Chicago that was growing in the 80s like fast. They got to be like 50 to 100 doors. This is late 80s. Um, and we were literally next to each other. And I remember and one came, came by the two owners at that time. And this is before they started and they came and saw us the next time they came back and they had a booth next to us. And you know what? They went into 500 doors and that company out of Chicago went away. So, you know, that's what I mean by opportunities and by it is colorism. You know, and it is, it is deliberate from both sides, from the business side, but also from the resources side in terms of control and distribution. And I mean, we could look at all industries and say it's the same thing. And that, that's where we have to get past color, but we also have to, in my eyes, build our own tables to change that paradigm shift, make a paradigm shift. So when we do look at streetwear now, and I mean, its growth has been exponential. I will say that the retail structure has changed. It's not the same. So you do have a certain control of your dollars. But again, why are the people of color now and the creatives missing from this narrative when the originators started it? So how do we now put the story back in? How do we create these spaces? You know, it's rather unfortunate because, you know, I walk the stores quite often and for a space that we created, it's so unfortunate to see so few black owned brands in the independent boutique stores. Whereas back in the day, Dord Academics, Rock Aware, FUBU, in those days, we dominated the stores. But today, you know, it's, it's an Australian brand, it's a Canadian brand, it's everything but us. And I, you know, for, for myself, I feel one of few in those spaces when it should have been the same players that were back in the day still being very involved. And it's just unfortunate to see, but I'm sure there's a financial um, rhyme and reason for all of it, but it's just, it's still a very open territory and we have to educate the, the store buyers as well as the consumers uh, to, you know, to at least participate in buying and buying black for space that we created. Do we need to participate in also breaking down these biases? To, to um, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Donald. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, to your point, it's interesting. Um, I've had people go like the the term microaggression comes to to uh, to mind, where I've had people go, "Wow, um, this is really sophisticated." Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Like you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, motherfucker. That's what I do. Like, I do sophisticated shit. I do lowbrow shit, too. But, like, why is this surprising to you? Like, if it wasn't for us, this platform wouldn't exist. And now, all of a sudden, like, everybody else jumped on the bandwagon and the, and the table to turn. And to April's point, 
it is looting. It's also like sharecropping. It's like, oh, the slavery shit ended. Everybody's a sharecropper now. So we can like kind of enlist you, but you got to work for the factory store. We'll kind of give you some bread, but not, you know, just enough. And it's, it's, it's literally a uh, financial share problem. Right, right. You, uh, you know, I think, we, you know, it, it goes back. It, it's definitely uh, money, you know. Money is the, the bottom line is the bottom line, you know. And I think a lot of times actually in the industry, you know, the, the business aspects are kind of shoved away. And that's creative. A lot of times you just focus on that creative aspect of it as well. Uh, I think the thing we have to go back to is what April said. We have to control the narrative. We have to be the ones that are actually creating our own validation in this situation. When we do that, then we control it. You know, and whatever it means financial, whatever it's in terms of, you know, making sure we market and promote a certain way. And we need to be the validators of our own stuff. We validate it. We set up the platform to validate and we establish that in our way. And then therefore we are in control and we control our own destiny. That's where it has to go. And that's where it has to be, you know, for us to actually go. And people look at things differently when it makes money. When it makes money, you're not a color, you're green. Okay? And that's the same thing that happened with us when we actually launched our brand. People didn't even know where to put the stuff as they called it. They were like, oh, they want that, they want that, but we don't know where to put it in the store. And they figured out where to put it as soon as people started to buy it, you know? Uh, so, and I think today we can control our destiny a little more because we actually have the website and the internet to actually do that more so than in the 90s, we didn't have that. And now we can do that. The internet is our way out, I, I think, in a lot of ways to actually do that. That's our own selling platform. That's what we can actually do and maneuver and voice what we want to say, you know, from that platform as well. I just, I would love to chime in and add to what you're saying. I think content is king. And I think that what we're doing right now, that's, that's amplifying our voices. This conversation is amplifying our voices. Um, the, the remix, Hip Hop Times Fashion, you know, that's on Netflix now, but the response from that, just from people hitting me from all over the world, that I never knew about you. I'm sorry. I never knew. And, and, and there's so many other things. I know you guys have a museum, right, TJ? A museum exhibit? Well, we have, well, I'm here right now at the exhibition, actually, sitting okay. outside of it. Uh, so but, you're telling yeah. your own story. That's taking control of your narrative. And that's what we have to do. You have to. All forms, tell the story. Pick up the bullhorn, get on social media, and maybe it's not social media. Maybe it's through product, you know, maybe it's through, but being creative and we have to collaborate. I think that lateral cooperation creates vertical movement. And I think that there's more power together than us all on our own. Together is a powerful medium and it's proven to be in our history. So we have to utilize that to empower each other and our stories. I wanted to, um, yeah, like jump in here as well, because I think the, the word gatekeepers was used early on in this. And I do think, um, you know, to TJ's point, the world is different now. Um, do traditional fashion gatekeepers used to be, you know, editors of magazines and, and uh, you know, buyers and runners of showrooms etc cetera, etc cetera. there used to be a certain path that you had to go um in order to get where you needed to be and now there is more of an open playing field so like what can what can you do to use today's tools um to amplify first <clears throat> i think one of the things that we all have to be mindful of is uh you have to stop caring I don't give a shit what anybody says. I don't care if what happened, like I remember in 2008, I, I know I'm pretty sure that the, the crash affected a lot of us on this board. 2008 um, kind of swept the legs from under me uh, in terms of the industry, uh, may, maybe even a little bit sooner than that. <clears throat> and, and, uh, then I remember like interviewing at 
um, major fashion houses. And they were very dismissive and insulting and, and all that stuff, right? And, and at a point, I just like, okay, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to go to an inter- Oh, I'm sorry. Am I muted? Mm-mm. Am I muted? You're good. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I came to a point where I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to prepare to go be insulted, right? Thank you. So, so I, I woke up one day and um, I said, I, I'm not doing it anymore. I, you know, I've, I've always had pretty, uh, pretty good client business and uh, I, I moved forward in that. But when I decided to do the Bobby Joseph brand, I stopped caring about the gatekeepers. I stopped caring about the insults. I stopped caring about being dismissed or labeled a pigeonhole. And I just focused on my brand, right? And, and, and it's evolved over time. Um, and now, now because you are the, we are our own gatekeepers um, in terms of how hard you want to work, right? How connected do you want to be? How, uh, how enthusiastic and energetic you want to be, right? Like all those things um, help create sales for our individual brands, right? So like holding on to how it once was or who said what in the past and uh, that, that shit's a waste of time. Moving forward, moving forward, I to, to April's point, content about content is like, what are your what are your visual assets look like? What are some of the stories you're trying to tell? What what like how polished up are you? How connected to to um, other brands and people and things and and movements is your thing? Those are the things that are important now. Like, um, you know, because uh, some denim enthusiasts who make a uh, hundred pairs out of Japan every six months like I don't give a fuck about them. Like, they 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 don't pay my rent. You know what I mean? Like, it, I, I, I appreciate it. You know, like that's part of, um, you know, doing that kind of shopping and research that has kind of refined me and, and all of us probably on this board in terms of um, how sophisticated we are now. But it, it, holding on to, to, that's a waste. That's a waste. And, and this, this is a billion dollars right here. This is a billion dollars, just five people, six people. Like why? Why are we holding on to like what somebody else said? We'll just do it again. We'll just do well, it at again. that point to do it again, because the narrative is a little bit different. And to your point, I've sat in the same interviews, and you have to like jump through hoops to prove right. that you can actually design something. Right. Like right. I know how to use like, like, your, like your tech pack's not thirty pages long. Thank you. Like I know how to use a computer, and I don't think I think for the audience where all of us understand that I think it's really important for the audience to really get that insight because I don't think a lot of people think about that because when I have conversations they're like oh those brands are dope I'm like yeah to you they are but when you sit in a traditional environment they look down on it for some reason it's never been good enough and when you create your own then yes you control your narrative but for kids that are coming up for them to have that kind of ownership to understand that their creativity is just as valid as anybody else that Mm -hmm. actually their vision is stronger than anybody else's because they drive culture drives dollars and that's what i think people need to understand ali i should said something earlier if you want to talk about it about how black culture drives dollars and if you want to just speak on that quickly Uh I mean, it's, it's, we're looking at a mirror image, I think, like hip hop with the history of rock and roll. So you have this thing called rock and roll. It comes out of the blues. It's black culture. White kids look at it as rebellious. It's exciting. It's new. It's not crooning. Uh, it moves fast. It evolves out of, excuse me, blues and jazz. A lot of kids used to call it rock and roll jazz. Um, and then there's a style of dress that evolves out of that, right? And then you have this whole other side of the industry, and then it's accepted by white youth as rebellious teenage culture. So hip hop does the same thing. Streetwear has done the same thing. It's mirror image, just a different time. But then what happens is you get the corporations that are like, oh, wow, there's all this bread there, right? Um, and then you look at all of what's been happening with with uh protests and riots and the white financial establishment 
freaking out on how they're going to say we give a fuck. Um, so there's all this like, like we just existed now. Like, right. Exist. And it's like, like hey, we're here. And, in my eyes, the only people that have been caring have been Ben and Jerry's because they're actually supplying you with, you know, why, how, what you can do. You know, this is why we are where we are. Really supplying people with information. Um, and anything else is apologists. I mean, can you imagine being, and, and largely performative, can you imagine if black kids collectively stop buying just out of the Nike brand, stop buying Jordan and Dunks? It would be an utter collapse because white kids, I don't care what anybody says, white kids started buying Jordans and Dunks because black kids were buying Jordans and Dunks. That's the way the whole chain of events events works. And yeah, some people might say like contextually it's different now and blah, 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 blah. But it had to follow as interesting culturally, like where people love to erase context and nuance. Um, but contextually and timeline wise, sneaker culture came from black kids. I remember getting in a new balance because all my friends that went to historically black colleges brought them back up from down south because it was like some DC, Maryland shit. And it was like, oh, New Balance. Hmm, I gotta kind of get on that. And, and there's a, a bigger picture because it's also like, uh, what's the word? Um, aspirational goods. It, it, you know, if you had New Balance at the time, it meant you were wealthy. And so there's a bigger like ec social economic conversation. Um, and us spending money to feel better about ourselves. And that's like a whole other part of the conversation I'm sure we'll circle back to. But I think it's really interesting to Bobby and to everybody else's point that like, you kind of just have to stop giving a fuck and make your own. Because once you look for acceptance outside of yourself, you become beholden to everything else. And so if you look at that on a business scale, um, it's like being a people pleaser. Nobody likes a people pleaser. That's why most of the brands right now look like shit because they all look like the same brand. It's like well, one big brand. Example. Sorry. It's like, Go ahead. Sorry, and it's very critical. Um, it's, not, it's true though. But it's like one giant brand. So, oh, we're all looking at the same trend boards. Well, what happened to not looking at trend boards and being your own person, which is right. where everybody on this board came from. We all started but our own things. We discovered trends and brought them. They now aggregate our trends. But we didn't. They don't just, create we, we, the trends. We discovered we, and created trends. No, we you didn't guess. discover them. We created them. Created them. So when you balance them, that is my point. Like kids that went to historically black colleges created the trend of New Balance being popular on the street, and then it went. You know, from there it might have gone to Brooklyn or Uptown or you know anywhere else. Air Force Ones. When I was a kid, if you saw Air Force Ones, you're like, that's a Harlem dude. And then later, it was discovered by a handful of Brooklyn dudes that might have gone to like Harlem Prep or, um, but like nobody wants to talk to those stories. So then, I mean, one of the conversations I'm having with these dudes from Nike is like, why is Drew Greer get written out of like the right. dunk story? Nobody okay. would, would be wearing dunks if it wasn't for Drew Greer, but it's a black dude. And he's completely written out of the story. Um, anyway, sorry, kind of like spun off on a no, bunch of different places. Example, though, um, it's creation versus aggregation, because you, right. you're creating the basis that have honestly lasted 30 years, and now they're just aggregating. They're just right. taking that content, and they've turned streetwear into consumerism. It's no longer sure. culturally based. It's just grab it, grab it, like the whole hype culture, which is fine, because back then it was the same thing. I mean, my colorways were created based on what Nike was making. We right. had it all hooking back because it was all interconnected. Like you had an in in Nike because you needed to know what colors were coming out in spring. And that just seems normal. No, you're looking at it and it's, it's still beautiful to see it in its essence, like the creation and how it literally just continues to give like your vision continues to give generation after generation. But where I find the frustration is there's a lack of knowledge, which is why we're having this panel. Because knowledge is power and power allows you, once you have the knowledge, bias is hard for you to have because now you're seeing it as it is. But 
through this aggregation, like for your point, like create your own, create your own. Like for you, Don Juan, you did create your own. You had academics and then you literally went, whoo, into luxury. Like PRPS was incredible denim at a much higher price point with an elevated thought process. Like, did you experience, I'm assuming you did experience bias because I think there was conversations where you didn't want people to know it was a black brand. So as we build these things, do you think that bias still exists? And I know we don't give a fuck because nobody gives a fuck anymore, but. Yes, it's, it's wholeheartedly exist. You know, those brands back then that we had created, the word urban had become a dirty word. So I wanted to create something that was quite commercial, a luxury commercial line, and something that I was very familiar with living in Asia for a long period of time prior to coming to the U.S. to design uh, uh, academics. And uh, I felt like I had to create a company and launch it in Europe and be like this silent person where the brand and the integrity of the product took precedence just so that, that it would take off and then bring my face to the table thereafter. Um, I mean, it, the unfortunate thing is I had to do that, but the fortunate thing, it worked. I had to take this calculated backseat role just to get the brand to take off. I didn't, I wasn't part of that LA denim circle that I was, you know, I knew guys, but I wasn't, and I knew, I knew my shit. I knew denim, I knew how to make denim, I knew how to do washes, I was a very technical person, but I was never really accepted in that LA denim circle. So I had to go out of the spectrum, go to Japan, manufacture it, come back and launch it in Europe just to make it work. And uh, it's, it's just sad that I have to be so calculative in the process of doing it, but that was the time, that was the only way that I had, had forecasted and, and it working. Today, I mean, you could do different things. The world is a totally different uh, playing field, but you know, it's, it's, it, that's really, t really what I had to do. But of course, I, it, it, it took me taking the back seat uh, and not being the face for it for quite some time. But um, I think as time had, had gone on, people realized, oh, that's that Don Juan guy from academics. But they don't, they don't really know that, you know, my history goes long before academics, working at Nike and Donna Karen and Joseph Adu long before all of that. So the trajectory was there. I was very adamant I wanted to succeed in the commercial market and not just in this, what they call the urban playing field. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely eye-opening uh, throughout my career, how you're pocketed and sub, you know, subjugated to these groups. Um, but you learn, to, you learn to work within the confines of what they may pocket you, you know? So is that the key there that we can't follow their system? We have to create our own system. Yes, that's now that's, you have created a new brand. Do you feel that same pressure with this new brand? You know, the industry's changed so much, and this can spin off into a totally different conversation. I was actually having a conversation with my wife and my oldest son about this this morning about how you know I feel like social media has is is good and bad at the same time. I feel like. You know, back in the day during the academics, rock aware, you know, PRPS days, as long as you had something different, you could succeed, you know. Um, but today, the social media, I feel like people get on social media and they want to wear exactly what they see somebody else wearing. And so it's not about being in a store and being different. It's about, okay, I got to have my Stan Smith. I got to have this jean. I got to have this shirt because they see X, Y, and Z in it. And so screw all the creative, creative stuff and the beautiful stuff is I just got to have that. So the, the, the playing field is just different. You know, um, it's more about who's wearing what. And even though I would love for to see, you know, buy black, buy, you know, blacks buy, buy black or, you know, more black companies in this independent boutique stores. But um, it's just the market's changed significantly. You have to kind of work with the, the, the system the way it is. So, because this would be a whole conversation in itself and Aliash actually touched on it a little bit. Why, so the black dollar is a trillion dollars, yet it, the black dollar only stays in the black community six hours. So there also seems to be our own kind of internal to a certain degree bias. And if we think, and this is kind of a question off the top of my head, so it may sound a little crazy. <laughs> 
if we think that when black kids start buying black again, will the white kids follow? Is that part of kind of what's happening right now? Like buy oh, black, course. it's not just for black people, like it's for everybody. And to basically educate black people that, hello, we are here too. You know, our, gener our, ge our generation, our generation, it was, we were enamored by these brands. I know me growing up and I remember when I first got out of college and I was seeing Maurice Malone and Carl, you know, Carl and I, all these really great aspirational black brands as I saw it, they were aspirational. But I feel like this generation is so different. This young generation that, you know, I've had to, re each, I feel like each collection or each group of, or each uh, clothing brand I create, I have to attack a new generation of people every time. And I have to sit and I have to analyze and I have to investigate what they want and how they buy from an intellectual standpoint. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel like the, the opportunities are there, but you just have to attack it differently. I'm Bobby, sorry, I cut somebody off. I, 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 I can't stress enough about just not caring. <laughs> I, I, just, you. I just don't care what to, to okay to dovetail off what Don Juan's saying about um re-educating the consumers that's your job we're all educators up here that's your job I I embrace it I enjoy it I I you know like it's an easy way like being an educator is an easy way to storytell too right so you know you could say you know there's been I've had conversations with 50 people in reference to all of you all at some point in my career, right? So like, I, I enjoy being, being an educator in that. That's one. Two is direct to consumer, the margins are so, so much greater, right? So well, you're it, 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 it just allows me to just, I, I don't, you know, and I have friends with beautiful stores and I, and they asked me to be in them and I, I like, I, eh. Like, you you want me to ship to you wholesale and take half of what I would get off of my margins direct to retail and and you know like my website right. is producing orders every day I I don't know and the tra and the trajectory of this is like it just might like uh, retail might only be pop ups and um, some very special niche niche uh, uh beautiful stores right like just you know the the notion of being in 1600 foot lockers like who cares so, so you also <laughs> reimagining that retail space and how right, right like i'm gonna let you dictate ecosystem. color I, I'm, I'm gonna come up with this this great concept um of, of, of uh, for a brand for a vignette for for a delivery and then i'm gonna let somebody who does sales or buying, come in and tell me I need these colors. I'm like, no, no, we're not doing that. The days are over. The days are over. I, th I think it's too far for me. I think as a brand, I agree with you, Bobby. I, I came back and decided to, to do this because of the digital era and because I could pick up my bullhorn, because I could bridge the gap with, with generations, with storytelling, with telling about the 90s and, and how people that look like us created this multi-billion dollar industry without being preachy, but just doing through product and then them finding us, right? Um, and that's interesting to me. And I'm so with you on the direct to consumer because that was the thing. I don't have to jump through hoops with retailers anymore. And there's no markup there anyway anymore with chargebacks with such. We could go on and on there, but um, it's much more exciting to create a legacy brand now. And I think what I want to say on the other side is for me, I care because it's 30 years and I see some of the same obstacles, some of the same problems that existed when I started. And I mentor a lot of streetwear brands now that are kicking ass, but it's heartbreaking when they come to me with these same obstacles that existed when I started. So yeah, the gatekeepers, that syndrome is still here and it's changing. It's not changing fast enough. But the good news is we've never been at this point in time in history when we have the attention of the world. So I say put our foot on the gas pedal and let's make some noise. You know, now is the time to make people accountable, you know, to educate them. 
A lot of consumers don't even know what the struggles of a small business is. Add being black on top of that. You know, I think they're a lot harder on black businesses because of the stigmas that are out there about black business. So we have to dismantle some of that. We have to educate consumers. I think it's a whole pro process that can start taking place and unfolding, but I think there are opportunities too at this moment. And I think it's a moment we'll never see again. So it's gonna be up to us to decide as a community, as a fashion community, how do we wanna see the future? How do we want that? How, what do we want that to look like? I know I'll, I want more people at the top making decisions that look like me, more decision makers uh, in the boardroom, right? Color it up. And I, I don't mean just black, I don't mean just Latin, I mean a diversity of the world because that's when you're gonna get your best creativity and that's real, right? That's a real world. But at the same time, I wanna see more independence build together and, and create their own tables. So I, I'm, I'm gonna shut up now. Oh, no. Hello, keep going. So we have four minutes left. I don't know if everyone can see because there's still some things. I actually want to circle back to you, April. Are we good on time? Is everyone all right? Huh? All right, so April, circling back to how hard it is. As a woman of color, mm -hmm. as we sit here, if I wasn't in this picture and we're just panelists, just as brand owners, you're the only one. And we continue to see that if we look at streetwear, if we look at denim, Women of color saying underrepresented is actually silly because there is no representation. So the word under doesn't exist if we're like 0, 0, 0. 0.1%. What, we already know the challenges, but how do we start adapting that? Because as for me, as much as I think America is racist, I also think there's a huge sexism issue. Mm -hmm. And that misogyny that is just deeply rooted, especially in streetwear. So as a woman of color that owns a brand and that is constantly inspiring, what do we say to the girls that are watching right now that are kind of like, I want to be part of this. How do I do this? I mean, you know, me being the only one here is a good representation of that because I am a trailblazer, but there are many other great female designers with brands that exist. Yet a lot of panels call me because I think that we're so underrepresented, you know, and it's like, like pulling on the same people, you know, I could go on and on with names, but to the women, I say, keep kicking ass, keep making product. What Bobby said, don't give a shit about anybody else. You're doing this to express yourself and hopefully to create a business. And so focus on that. Don't focus on color. Don't focus on sex. Just be a badass and kick ass and make the best product. Let the product lead and eventually everything will catch up. But if you worry about that, you'll never get started and you'll never be at your best. Agreed. So the next part we're kind of going to unpack is what do you feel, and we'll get into the other questions. So from a contribution point, and I know we're not talking about the past, but I do think for the panel and the people that are listening that don't know you, that don't know what you've created, that it's important to educate and talk about your contributions as far as your brands, where your contribution comes from. Like when I first thought about this question, I could list like to your point, cross colors denim. When I think color block, I actually Googled it, cross colors comes up. That's a huge fashion trend. When I look at April, I think of workwear, the rugged wear suit, raw denim, selvage denim. Like there's so many things that came out of that period that are still so prevalent right now and still so important. So if you think about your brands, like what was your contribution? And sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Keep going, each one, whoever wants to start. Because each of you gave something amazing. No one wants to uh, <laughs> I sent it the email uh, here yesterday to think about this one because it's not an easy question. No one reads their email. Not so much. Um, <laughs> just showing that um, kids are far more intelligent than the salespeople that build the boxes to sell them goods and that they have far more points of interest. I always found it fascinating sitting in corporate meetings and 
the sales manager was talking, basically just belittling his consumer and acting as if they were some sort of sheep. My guy, which is why I hate the term as a term of endearment now, because it always reminds, it's like PTSD reminds me of like <laughs> some dipshit sales manager going like, my guy only likes the hat that goes with these sneakers and he only listens to this and he only listens to that. It's like, no, you know, Donald Juan's wearing a fucking Bad Brains t-shirt. Like people like a lot of different shit. Um, and basically you get to a, a point of sales dictating design, which is really da dangerous. Um, so being able to build a brand that defied all the boxes. I feel like that's, you know, cause we did outerwear with alpha in particular. We did outerwear, we did Japanese denim, we did selvage denim, we did. And this is all in 1990, so I just is, want to uh, No, Alpha America is 98. 98, so if you um, think about the references to where selvage is now and where it was back then, no, I don't feel like a lot of people are using it. No, but I mean, prior to that, the whole, pretty much everybody on this page was using selvage denim um, in 92, but who else was, I think my thing is who else was using it? It was really something that had kind of gone away. Yeah, and it had absolutely gone away. And it became this kind of like when we all discovered like what was so cool about it, um, we all Puffed jumped on it. Right. Puff it with um, <laughs> and, it, you know, similarly, everybody here made a pilgrimage to go to, to Evisu at one point in time. You know, everybody. <laughs> it, you know um, because back then we had those dollars to also spend. Sure. Um, so contributing that to a larger pop culture, I suppose. You know, bringing that to to contemporary pop culture. At least for me, that's my you know how I feel my contribution is, and saying that like there's a kid from Brooklyn that that rock climbs and snowboards and skateboards and throws hip hop parties and knows Puffy and you know like or or just going to start his own thing and really doesn't care about the status quo and collected polo and help North Face make millions of dollars because that's where all their money came from anyway uh, <laughs> um, you know there's a, it's a total tangent but there's a scene with Cedric the Entertainer at the end of Get Shorty where he talks about our contribution to the GDP that everybody should watch because it's amazing. Uh, I will go off on a complete tangent, so I'm gonna leave right there. I don't mind the tangent. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the denim space, the majority, like you ha have people like TJ and April and Carl um, who, for me, were, you know, I worked for April for a little while when I was younger. Thank you, April. Uh, and watched and saw that, that this thing could be done um, and was a denim enthusiast and learned a lot through the space and got excited about the space watching the Aprils and the TJs and the Carls. And TJ's brand showed that it could be done on a huge scale um, and not as boutique. and globally accepted um and it you know we just kind of get written off into this like oh you know you want to go work for polo oh you work there mm, you know and it's that that thing again it's like a weird what they consider a microaggression you're not taken seriously somebody had written in the comments about um sorry yeah i don't know I, I shouldn't say I don't know. That means that um, I'm losing the plot. I'm gonna I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself um, right now. I have like too many thoughts going on. Sorry. Yeah, there's a lot of questions actually in the comments. I think um, TJ had a comment on. Um, I was just gonna. Do you mind if I just whip through the collection really quick, the the museum really quick, just walk through really quick, just yeah. to show some of the some of the things. Yeah. Is that fine? Because that Ooh. actually talks directly to what you've so that's why I want to show the pieces and kind of uh, to, to 
Tanisha, would you hold this? So just as some background, I can only quickly speak about this, but Cross Colors, it was closed without prejudice. So you're looking at, in the 90s, a brand that was talking about social and political issues before that was even really a major conversation. Now flash to 2020. It's like 5,000 5, square feet. And so you can see that here, and you can see the, the opening, you can see the videos. Uh, one thing that you guys should watch too is Fresh Dress, which is a great uh, documentary on hip hop, which is like shown never, here. But here, let's, uh, and then over here too, just so you can get a sense of the outfits and the whole look as far as cross colors, it was from top to bottom, as far as the uh, okay. denim is concerned. Everything there, as far as the graphic tees as well. And then the actual museum is actually based on historical events like Malcolm X, um, uh, Marcus Garvey, those intersections in the brand in terms of color and inspiration as well. And you can see that display here also. With these pieces. One thing too, we talked about denim, but we, if you look here at the um, display here, you can see the buttons and the zip uh, labels and all the things we did because we really focused on branding and making sure that everything was actually logoed out for the most part. And then here you can just see kind of a, a wide expanse of the exhibition uh, too, so you can get more of the pieces. Um, going back to Martin Luther King. Uh, and even a lot of the uh, advertisement too, if you, uh, on, on this part over here, where you can see the uh, Jaiman, who was actually uh, our model in the, uh, from Amistad and, and those uh, Blood Diamond and all that, as far as the billboard's concerned. And the color blocking that was mentioned too is actually shown here, also in the outfit here, as far as the denim is concerned, the color blocking uh, from Head to Joe. This was actually our first kind of color block look here for the uh, product. And then this is the last part, so like, don't take up all the time with the, uh, the actual exhibition. But here, you can see the amount of the ads that we actually had for the exhibition. And this blow up here is actually our hang tag that we had back in the day uh, that was actually on the clothes of Carl and myself. Um, and a lot of videos and everything were very popular back in that time as far as uh, MTV and VH1 and all that. So you can see here, a lot of the videos here from Mary J. Blige, TLC, uh, and even here, the one that actually kind of let everybody know that we were back was when Bruno Mars and Cardi B actually were at the Grammys uh, on stage. And so that kind of brings us back to where we are now. And now we're back uh, and pretty much selling uh, better than we were back in the day, especially right now with everything that's going on. So yeah. That kind of gives you an indication like of denim. That's what we want to hear, American heritage. Because that, that is excellent. what it is. Mm? That was excellent. I'm, you took me down memory lane. Uh, I, 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 I'm looking at it and I'm seeing how, uh, how inspired I've been over the years uh, with regards to your work, you and Carl's work. And uh, this museum is, is really well done. And when I get to, is there any way I can uh, sneak in when I get to LA? Oh, uh, you know what? It's closing on the 23rd, which is on Sunday. So it's the last day. Uh, and it's not even open to the public right now. I just happen to be here filming content so we can actually have something for our archives for it as okay, well. So, so, we so if, I, if I pop up on Friday, how can I get in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming with you. Is there a we'll, virtual we'll exhibition? See, we'll see what we can do. I'll see what I can do. All right. Let's I mean, out. when you look at what TJ did, honestly, when he showed the label package, how many people flash back to your 30 page label package? I was like, <laughs> thanks, TJ. But that was the whole, you opened up a space that allowed but we, all of us, April the same way. Like when you showed it could be done, that changed everyone's lens that said, all right, let's do this. So I guess our role now is to show and to continue to educate that this can be done. Yes, As Bobby it can said, be done. Fuck yeah. them, do what you need to do and just and, keep and, you know, and to, Yeah, and to Bobby's point too, you know, you don't listen to anyone because if we had listened to anyone back in the day, we wouldn't have done anything. Because everything was, everyone is telling us, you know, it was crazy, you know, you're doing color, you're doing all these things. And then you want to direct it to a specific market that wasn't even identified as a market at the time, you know. 
And you know, and to and and speaking of Jamaican, our marketing director was Jamaican back in the day, David Stennett, and he was the one that pushed us to make sure that we did do that and we did speak about it because he did not take no for an answer. We you don't know, do that. Like you do, Simone. Yeah, Jamaicans don't take no for an answer. I also might add your colorways. The first time I saw it, I was like, are they Jamaican? Because the colors that you are using were very indicative of Caribbean. And when I, I come from a very different background, so for me, I feel like I lived in a, a diversity bubble because I was raised in Jamaica, I went to Canada, my family is very diverse. And when I moved to America, I was in streetwear. And so everyone around me was a person of color. So I just had this kind of ecosystem and I was never really exposed until the crash and it all went away. And I was kind of like, wait, why are people looking at me? To your point, Bobby, why are they dismissing me? I run a $300 million mm -hmm. business. I was shipping monthly before you even knew what that was. I had Asian and European distributors and they're looking at me like, so can I see your tech back? I'm like, I'm applying for a vice president position. <laughs> Why do you need to see a tech pack? So for me, when I, and honestly, I think for everyone on this panel, just have a, I think I applied for a job for all of you at one point or another. So this to me, even as it reminds me that it is possible that yes. we just need to keep pushing. And when I see you, I, I, literally there's like this much that's just dedicated to what you created. <laughs> because it is so incredible and close without prejudice. I mean, we're in 2020, enough with this shit already. Like anyone that's listening, enough with this shit. Stop looking at it as this limited, you're all here because you're creative. Have vision, have purpose, look beyond because it's not what it is. And they're lying to you if you think it is. Like Don Juan is, if you saw his washes, like if you're a denim head, tears come to the layers of what he created the base colors, how we put the colors, just the construction of it. Like stitch color makes a difference. And if you pay attention to his denim, everything was different. The amount of colors. Like he should not have any, LA should be bowing down to you. And I think that's yeah, what- Yeah, I, I, I don't understand that LA thing. That, that's, that's the most illogical kind of story you told me ever. I was like, who in LA is dismissing Don? I, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's I can tell you. I mean, I know. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. Uh, yeah. But we need to know, and honestly, some of it is why I asked that question. We need to big ourselves up also. Like, they need to bow down. You are amazing. And if they're not, that's because their business is whack. And honestly, if you look at LA Denim, it all looks the same. And then you have Heritage, which is a cuff selvage. Bitch, we were doing that in 1989. Like, there's nothing new there. It's raw. April did raw in the 90s. So I really think that the more we say that, and yes, it's a little bit of this. And what's wrong with that? Sorry, I went, I went on a tangent there. So I think there's questions. Um, I think part of it, again, is it's, it's a, like the streetwear space or the quote unquote urban space. It's just, there's an old boys club that is ensconced itself in, in they are, to Bobby's point, they're the gatekeepers. And so if you roll up and you don't look the part, which basically just means being black, you could have all the stuff on and all the accessories and everything that's like hip and in trend and fucking smell like Juniper Ridge and all this other shit. Like they don't give a fuck because you're black. It's that simple. Like, I hope everyone um, listening is hearing this. It's and and um, then it's like, oh, well, you know, Don Juan builds fucking muscle cars. You know what I mean? Like he is the part, but he's black. That's, you know, it's a shame to me that he had to go. That it's brilliant that he knew the workaround to get to this space that he had gotten to, but it fucking sucks that he had to do it. Agreed. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. This is the whole point. Like we want people to hear these things and have it sink in. So here's the thing, what you just said, Ali, we, create, we created a thriving cultural ecosystem that exists today in fashion, a multi-billion dollar industry. We talked earlier about spending over a trillion dollars as consumers. The way we change that 
to start spending 10 cents of every dollar in our own community. That's going to change the landscape of fashion, but in everything else. If we only spend 10 cents of every dollar, we can employ every man, woman, and child. That's mind-boggling to me. But those are the things from a consumer standpoint, since you guys are listening, that you can do. Be deliberate. Be intentional about us here and anybody else that's Black. I'm rooting for everybody Black. So, you know, like, just put pour some of your money into those cups because it adds up and it's going to make the difference. We definitely are hiring more people that look like us. You know, we are creating more opportunities and opening doors for younger creatives. You know, energy feeds energy. Agreed. And I believe all the panelists will get resources so that can, they can actually look. And what's great about this time is now that it's easier to find the brands because so much, there's so many social media sites that are popping up. There's way more conversation. So you can be engaged and ensure that you are buying in. And te- I mean, when you say that 10 cents, I just, that's mind boggling. That's, that's, there's nothing that exists anymore that's 10 cents. Um, To your point, Simona, there was a question actually um, from Daniel Carmen who said, what platforms are black designers creating collectively to make store owners like myself aware of their brand, their work and their story? The real and the internet is a big big place and can be challenging as buyers um, to find brands, especially black owned. But I, I, I don't know if I would agree i think that you just got to do the work i think it is out there i think the information is out there the brands are out there i mean i guess things like this help but uh, i don't know what everyone else thinks about that what other you know platforms could there be go for it go for bobby i I don't i don't think that's realistic right like the he i and with with absolute respect it is uh the cheat sheet that you find a listing with all the black brands. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's, that's, that's a cheat sheet. That's like, Bye. yeah, if it existed, that'd be great. Um, that's kind of not how like uh, uh, creatives move, right? Like, I don't, I might not want to be on that list. Like I saw the, I saw the, uh, I saw the uh, email for black business on Google. Eh, yeah, okay. I also don't, I, my, my other thing, and I, I, I'll try to keep my rent small. I don't subscribe to black designer, black business supporting or uh, um, uh, what's what's the other one? Um, small business, like I don't, get that shit out of here. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't put those labels on me. Don't. Um, so if we'll we'll pop up eventually, we'll pop up eventually on on somebody's radar. But the all those like. Um, all those qualifiers, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be a part of. Um, this, this, um, this panel um, is the exception, but in general, I do not subscribe to black designer, black business supporting or small business. That you can, you can have that. So what's great about what you just said is, again, we don't have the, all the same opinions. We right. actually function with different entities and different thought processes. That's right. how you feel. April may feel different. I may right. feel different. I actually think there's a merge where I don't prescribe to it's just black designers. It's just black. I don't, because no one says white fashion. So why are you right. saying black fashion? Fashion right. is fashion. It happens to be that we drive trends and that's not your fault that you don't. And you're more of aggregators, but that's just culture. So again, if the panel that's listening, and it's kind of amazing that no one has dropped off. I keep looking at the participants. These are the things that your unconscious bias has to recognize. We are not all the same. We do not have the same opinions. We do not flow the same. We think differently and it sounds crazy, but these are things that I think people actually just think we're so monolithic. And yeah, I think for me today, I'm neither here nor there with it. I want my work to speak for itself and stand on its own platform in the stores. And if people are feeling the product, I want them to buy it, but I don't want them to buy it because, oh, I'm black. I understand what Bobby's saying with regards to that. I I want the product 
I think the work and the integrity that I put into my denim washes, I want it to stand on its own and I want people to value what they're seeing and that's it. So I can pose this then just to be a debate. So when you're looking at big companies and I know we're talking more smaller, but like say a Sephora who need and should have black business, black or in their selection. So why shouldn't we push them that you should have that? You should be buying black. Why don't you represent it? Because the people that are buying you are represented. Or, or the reverse. Okay. If you don't have it and you're looking for it, stop shopping there. <laughs> like, you know, it's your money. You don't, like, nobody's forcing you to go spend at a store that won't represent what you're looking for. Like, I don't shop there. You insult me or if you don't have what I want, I don't shop there. As simple as that. Like, uh, like you're also uh, someone that doesn't buy off the internet stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah, not really. <laughs> Very, I rarely. think there, from again, just man, there is a balance where you should have to have accountability, especially for me. I'm just all these big companies that said, and I'm talking in a larger ecosystem that put those black squares up, and we're saying, oh, we hear you, we see you, and I was kind of like weren't we there before? Like all of a sudden you see us when large corporations are putting percentages in saying, oh, we should buy black. We should buy these black brands. There's huge, and that's how their businesses grow. If you're at a million cap, how do you exponentially grow your business? And in some cases you need larger resources. You need those help, that help. Yeah, you, you know, I think uh, uh, to that point, though, you know, I, I really support buying black. I do, honestly. I support buying black. But I support buying good black product, not just buying black. I don't want, I don't want people to, to run out and say, I bought something black. Well, maybe they didn't ship it to you on time. Maybe you didn't, you know, maybe when you got it, the quality wasn't good. All those things still come into play. It's still business. It's still a company. It's still quality. It's still doing the things that you actually do as a business owner. You know, those things still have to come into play. It's not just buying black. It's buying good product, you know, that comes from a good place, that actually has a purpose, that actually, you know, sustains itself through years of whatever, you know, those kind of things still apply to that formula. But we as a culture, we need to start addressing it from the inside out. We need to look within and start there to actually support. And we do have to do research. It might, it might not be easy to find that black company that actually is doing a great job at what they do, but take the time and go through the internet, do whatever you need to do and find them. You know, do, your, do some homework. You know, we owe it to ourselves to do that. You know, it's not easy. And who said it was? Because it hasn't been easy for any of us anyway. You know, but we have to learn how to navigate for us and through us as well. So I want to circle back to something because this actually, when we were, when we had our brands, we also had media. So you're looking at Source, Extra Large, Vibe. There's two more that I can't remember. No, our media, our, our voice is now a little bit, and I don't know how to phrase this properly. It's a little bit more diluted. So you're seeing like streetwear culture again, it's predominantly white and Asian. How do we, because someone popped up, how do you get that visibility? Is it also the fact that it's brands, media, that our collective voice needs to be larger? Is depends on what your goal is. It depends on what your goal is, right? Like, so if you're, if you're an independent business now and you ship, a million dollars B to C, you made a lot of money. Right? Like that's that's a really healthy year. Whereas if you go back to nineteen ninety nine and you shipped a million dollars, the margin is way thinner, way thinner, right? Like there's just so many. Just your media, your your media buy for that month might have been fifty k, right? So and 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 the production on getting the uh, the production cost on doing the photo shoots and getting the stuff to media, that might have been another 20k, right? So like, what? And and then you're shipping wholesale, and then you're dealing with uh, discounts and chargebacks and things like that. So like, 
a million dollars in 99 is a lot less than a million dollars now. I think my point, sorry, I may have not put it correctly. It's more that back then to the gentleman's point, he could find us because there was a media resource that was talking about us. So no, you're not seeing that same representation where it's again, our because we had an ecosystem. There was a predominantly ecosystem that created that kind of circle of information, even the retailers. Yes so and no, because you also weren't getting into the editorial sections of Vibe Source if you weren't advertising. They would do a favor here and there, but for the most part, if you were a small brand uh, at the time, you weren't you weren't getting in the editorials, right? Like like you know you might have knew a stylist and they did through your bone, but like you weren't gonna be in there monthly. Yeah, you had to buy a page. Yeah, back then. had to buy for the most part. Right. Which was nothing shy of more than or less than ten thousand dollars back then. Great. Right. Yeah, and now your whole budget for the year can be ten thousand. It's gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. But those those magazines today, magazines in general, are less relevant today in the market versus social media platforms. So. So that's what I'm saying. So in social media, the voices that can help promote that, do you think that they're being amplified? Like it's, it's the same as high, high beast and complex, right? So, you know, you gotta you gotta pay to play to to get over there too, right? It's, it's yes. no different. The same, absolutely the same. Hmm. So do we want to look at some more questions or anybody want to go on a rant? Don Juan, you didn't get to rant. Uh, I'm not a ranter. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we all had a moment of ranting. <laughs> I, I have a good subject that I think everyone might want to rant on if you want it. Yeah, great. Uh, someone has asked him, Bruce Johnson has asked, um, he said actually he doesn't know if this is a question, so let's see. Um, when I look at people like Virgil, Heron, Don C and that tribe, how associated are any of you with them? Has anyone thought about tribes and building them? Today, you don't need help, you only need you. Bobby's message is loud and clear. Um, I'm sure all the panel feel the same, um, they're already doing it. But yeah, bringing up the subject of, of Virgil, Heron Preston, etc. That's, that's the Chicago crew though, right? So that's the Chicago crew and they're anchored by Kanye. So, you know, you, you saw that type of, um, you saw that type of uh, 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 movement more so in music, right? Like somebody has a, a star artist and then they bring along their producers and their other artists and they have their own record label. So they just, they applied the same concept. Um, with clothing and they are also a little a little bit younger than us right so um they don't have the same um uh they don't have the same kind of um ways of doing business that we were indoctrinated with so i i, I love it i love watching them they do, I, I applaud them all day long they're doing a fantastic job i love it do any other questions There's, I, mm -hmm. Say it. <laughs> Just say it. Mm. This is the whole point of this. Say it. Uh, I will. Heron can design. That's all I have to say. <laughs> the rest of those dudes are just hire people and use people to design for them. Right, that's fine. Everybody here is a designer. There's, it's, it's a different conversation. As a tribe and a collective, it's fantastic to watch. But I like to call them aggregators. Yeah, none of those dudes are designers except Heron. No, if you ask one of them to draw something, none of them could except him. And okay. he's that. And, and to that point, he's the one that that can really ride a skateboard and can do all the things that he talks about doing. And a lot of people might get pissed at me because I'm not supposed to black or bash other black creatives, but. Um, I'm a big fan of, of do your own work. Agreed. If you're going to say that you're that, do your own work. I don't really care. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not really worried about their acceptance. Because I've had the conversations with those dudes. Um, yeah. I don't know. Whatever. It's a different time. Well, to your point. Anyway, but it's cool. It's cool to watch and, you know, get yours. But it's just a different kind of get yours. Our get chores came from a um, 
you it was a far more meritocratous environment you know i've always everybody here like you're like wow i watched don juan get it i've seen him build tech packs i've seen him i bumped into him on the streets in hong kong like you're out there doing the work it wasn't like oh yeah i just got this this dumb kid that has like four thousand followers to do all my work for me and i'm gonna call it my brand and i'm gonna throw him a bone like throw him some likes at least I don't, I have I respect a, to those dudes. So it's again, it's a different kind of, it's a different thing. Like people like whatever six nine because he's a rat. That's a new culture. It's like it's the antithesis of of where we. So of what this conversation is. So that's cool. You know that that crew, the, that crew design is a very touchy subject for a lot of designers. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm a bit old school myself. You know, formally trained, whatever, and you know, sometimes I feel like you know, the bar sometimes has gotten lower, you know, and uh, the work, I feel like the work needs to get put in over time. But um, they, they, you know, I love the accolades that they've developed, you know, for themselves. I love, I love the amount of press that they've gotten. I like to see black faces and those positions, you know, but, you know, is the bar the same back then like it is today? I, I don't know. I just feel different about it. I have a follow-up question to that. What are some of the brands that you guys actually look up to today, right now? I want to tap out on that because I don't have a good <laughs> answer. I think that says a lot. I mean, right now I have one, a vintage Bad Brains and a pair of vintage Levi's. So I'm a more of a vintage guy. So, I mean, aspirational brands, I'm low budget when it comes to buying brands. Right. Yeah, it's, tough, it's tough when you don't know what it costs to make it, right? So, exactly. exactly. I'm going to ask a question. Is it hard now for us to be aspirational because what we're buying is what we created to a certain I, degree? And I say that with... Yeah. My, my, take it my guy, you take it apart, yeah. My, yeah. Guy, my guy, Charnay from Leisure Life said to me a few years ago, he said, um, Bobby, if you could wear your own stuff from head to toe, you would. And that just, that really struck a nerve with me. And I was like, that's the goal. <laughs> I want to wear my own stuff head to toe. And hopefully you do too. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you want, you know, the people who, um, you know, the, the people who buy my product, hopefully they, they enjoy it and they feel the same way. Um, every, every, everyone on here and a, a whole litany of other people, I really enjoy their stuff. I, re I, I think it's just thoughtful and creative. Um, I, I just want to pivot and wear my own stuff now. I think to Bobby's earlier point about not giving a fuck, having aspirational things is a sign of insecurity. As you go older, you get less insecure. I don't need certain things. So yes, there are certain, there are certain things that are expensive for a reason. And they become so somewhat aspirational, having a Range Rover. It's like, you know, this very old British company, the Berriata. But I'm not worried about impressing anybody anymore. I want to feel good in my own things. And I know April's giving me the side eye about that. But like, I don't need... So when you're younger, right? You're a young kid in, in the city. I want to floss. I want to look fly. I can look fly without aspirational goods, is my point. And if I'm conditioned to consume aspirational goods versus buying land or stock or something else, that's my point, I guess. Like, so I'm far less worried because I'm far more confident with myself about being accepted. I feel like a lot of our consumption as black people for aspirational goods was about finding acceptance. Um, and once you're not worried about con you know, being accepted, you're not really worried about the aspirational goods as much. To Bobby's point, don't give a fuck. Yeah. So never be a know, closing quote. I don't get a fuck. Up. I like the profit margin of making aspirational goods, right. but I'm I mean, also not going to like really Virgil, like feed anybody the Kool Aid. When I see some of Virgil's stuff, honest to God, a flashback to stuff that we did in like nine to five. So some of it is just kind of. Like, I, I don't get that feeling of, whoa. But then again, to your point, we've been in it so long. And I do think that our time 
allowed us so much exploration and discovery and creation that things just came together where now it's a lot of aggregating and translating. It's not creating. No, I get frustrated that it's called creative, like that these people are called creatives. Make a new category. Call them aggregators, like I yeah. do. You know, even the word like, uh, what's it called? Curator is like, it's not even the same word anymore. No. You're not a curator, you're, you make Pinterest boards and you sell them. <laughs> Sorry. You're not an influencer? You make Pinterest boards. You're a high-end Pinterest board maker. <laughs> oh, you cracked me up. Sorry. All can right. I, can I say one thing? Um, of course. So earlier, when, I, when we were talking about Black designers, I agree with everyone. Let the product lead, right? So it wasn't, I wasn't making the blanket statement of just buy Black, A. Eh? I said if we spend 10 cents out of every dollar and that's not aimed at black everybody can do that and start supporting black and the reason why i'm focusing on black is the same reason why there's a statement that black lives matter because our fashion industry is a microcosm for what's existing in this country and everything is off right now and it's not a level playing field and so when I say I'm focused and rooting for everybody black, I'm focusing for that seesaw to go like this. And so if you guys can understand that, you guys can understand, of course, I, I don't have, everything in my closet is not black because I love great product, you know, but I don't wear everything from head to toe that's me anymore. I buy other black brands right now and i wear them on social media because i have a modest following and i'll amplify those brands because they might not have that that platform to let other people know about them because 44 percent of black businesses have already folded between february and april so imagine how many of fashion have gone away so you know it's it, that's probably even a higher number if we just look at fashion so I'm just saying like, yeah, but I let the product leave period. As a woman, as a woman being Blexican, starting out when I did, it wasn't popular. I was scared as shit to let people know that it was a woman doing a men's brand because it was a very misogynistic time within hip hop. I was in love with hip hop, but I wasn't sure if people would have received that. So I let the product leave and speak for itself so i'm always a firm advocate of you can never make something sustainable you could get all the hype you want but without substance it's not going to last so it is about for me product and i think when i say for me i mean when we talk about culture and creating a thriving ecosystem it's about quality as a community we just have to be intentional to level the playing field that's all so my assumption is when you say buy black, honestly, sorry, is that it is of quality. It is of product. I wouldn't That's all. That I just wanted to product. clarify that. We're going to obviously buy great product. And I think that association that black brands give great product. Black brands develop great product, creative, quality, unique, amazing. Because my when you said it, I just assumed that we're talking about great product. Right, right, right. But I like and then, why would I buy shit just because it's from, I'm not going to buy crap just because it comes from, you still need to show up. And I, Right, and I just want to put not just black, but everybody dig through the crates to find some cool black brands right now. Let's bring the stock up so we can level playing field, like that's all. And that's the same thing with Latin, that's the same thing with indigenous. I think the fashion industry has a lot of whiteness, if we're honest. And we need to get rid of the whitewashing and replace it with, um, equality and, and have some equity spaces that make sense uh, i just thought about somebody so brand that that um that uh inspires me a brand from houston texas called grits um mm -hmm. levi and toya um and they had initially wanted to start out in the streetwear space and then kind of created their own lane um which is really cool um, and, you know, 
I like the fact that they subversively push uh, a difficult conversation, you know what I mean? Um, Cause they're, you know, or an uncomfortable conversation, just the name alone. Cause grits is like, it's not grits is, you know, you, you make what you can out of it. Right. Um, and that their mascot is a crow and is, is basically poking fun at Jim Crow. So instead of having somebody like gentleman, Jim Crow from, from Dumbo, he's the reverse. He is using, um, you know, using it to combat the system, if you will, um, by co-opting and turning around. Uh, so I really like Grits There's another brand um, called Rosser Riddle, which is mostly music based. It's not a black brand, it's a young white cat from Georgia, um, but he makes some really cool rock and roll shirts. And what he does is he works officially, he, he doesn't have a lot of bread, but he works with like Sam Cooke's estate and the money goes back to Sam Cooke. If he makes Sam Cooke's shirt, he does the Otis Redding shirt, he does stuff like that. Um, but he's con uh, contributing to their family's estates respectfully. And I think so he's not just kind of co-opting this thing. And I like those two brands. Um, and they inspire me. And they're mostly printables business, but they do really cool stuff and they put in a lot of work. Let me let me let me dive in. I, I and Bobby. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with the exception of the panel I, and what you just said, it made me think of some brands that are friends of mine as well as some some brands that I really like. One is, is Leisure Life. He had a store for five years in, uh, on Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn. He makes his own product. He has his own, he's, he's offline. I mean, he's online only now, but I like his stuff. I also like uh, Fruit Market. They make some really cool stuff. He ties that to being a vegan and, um, uh, he, t he does storytelling through food and cuisine and, and, and being a vegan and ties it back to his, his, uh, his um, professional design story. And, and lastly, I, I really like Victory Lab. And um, Victory Lab, what is, uh, what's so cool about them is much like Supreme, is victory lap is a is a is a, a sentiment so when you see a victory lap uh, a, a garment that says victory lap across the chest i like that it's a, this sentiment like, you know like i just i just had a victory i just did something great so those are those are my three brands that are uh owned and designed by black people that are, that are, i i think is special i'm just gonna Piggyback since we're shouting out two. I'm gonna say two of my mentees that are great streetwear brands. One is Live Streetwear, uh, doing her thing. It's very nostalgic of the 90s, but it's now. But you can tell she was definitely inspired by that time period. Um, Avenue N, if you've seen the t-shirt that says ghetto until proven fashionable, that's Avenue N. Um, I like what Fina Well is doing. A lot of her silhouette, she's not really streetwear, but as a black designer, I just love how she's creating beautiful silhouettes and, and telling our story through fashion. Love it. This has been incredible, honestly. One, I feel like I haven't seen all of you in the same place ever. So, on that alone, <laughs> that was amazing. And I Vegas. Hmm? Vegas. <laughs> oh, let's not go back to magic. That could be its own show in itself. I mean, what would magic be without all of us? Are those brands? It would have been a very boring, but I want to also thank Amy for, she's been listening to me rant for about five days or three, a month. And Morgan, who started this whole conversation, because again, sharing the stories and just amplifying and allowing ourselves to be visible. There's the statement of, if you never see yourself represented, you might think you do not exist. And uh, we exist. And I think it's a very nece a necessity for younger kids coming up to see that we exist in very different spaces, that we're not all the same, and that you can find yourself in one of us or in any of us. So I'm done talking now. Shout, shout out to Morgan uh, at Smokey Hanoi. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, big incredible. shout. 
Right. Definitely. Shout out to you, Simone, for facilitating and, and, and also having such great questions. I think you pushed the envelope well with some Definitely. really thoughtful questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. I literally have It's, it's, it's great to have such a diversified panel, that's for sure. Yeah, it is. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I appreciate your openness because when I, the first question I asked, like, a whole bunch of people, and I'm like, can I go there, like, just right off the bat? And for me, it's necessary, though. Like, I'm so sick of this shit. Like, I'm tired of it. I don't want to walk in if I decide I want to have an interview. I don't want you looking at me. And to Bobby's point, that's why I don't interview and I do my own thing now. Like I have a client and I love the fact that he's from the Caribbean and I can talk this way and I don't have to change my voice for it. Like why should I have to, cons or why should we have to shrink to fit into your space? Fit into mine now? And I think that's the conversation I just want to constantly push and I appreciate all of you and because again, you are, the beginnings. I am here because of all of you. Well said. And I'm done ranting again because again I'm a ranter. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank much, you. all of thank you. you. There's been so many comments and thank, thank you guys in the, uh, in the chat. Um, absolute legends, amazing words, um, so insightful. Um, I wanted to just also end saying that. Everyone who did register will be sending out a link to this conversation on YouTube and also a lot of the references that were mentioned throughout. Um, so we'll be including all of those links, further watching, further reading, further research, if you wanna dive deeper into these iconic people and brands. But yeah, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Oh, for CJ, I think you need to do a virtual tour real quick. Like send it to us. I would like to actually see it. Oh, like, yes, 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 yes. Like yes iPhone yeah. video right before you leave. Well, go on Instagram live. That would be is, great. TJ, Seriously. is there a virtual um, exhibition? No, I there mean, is. We're, we're actually filming today for that. So okay. Okay. please oh, cool. send us the footage. Cause I, yeah, I, will, I will, I will, I will. But I'll just do a little quickly right now just to just see pretty quick. TJ, I'm going to connect with you offline and see if I can get in there on Friday. All right, Are all right, yeah, do that. please, please, okay. yes, please do that. And, please tell uh, me you're not moving to LA. Because <laughs> everybody and their mother is moving to LA and I'm not prepared. In the San Diego, Bob. Swag. You never answer, you know. House of Swag, you guys, check out House of Swag too. Serious Houston Live. All right. Beautiful. Excellent. So dope. I see, I see all the walls that I want to Instagram. Exactly. <laughs> but you see some of the outfits and I'm like, yo, wasn't that on like the whole flashback feeling? Like you are American <laughs> heritage. You are American design. Well, and you guys, I don't know if you know about uh, California African American Museum, but you need to check it out. You know, yeah. whenever you're in LA, come through because it's an amazing uh, place. They do a great, amazing job too, so. I would love to do that. I think that's the other thing, sorry, to say. we need to normalize that <laughs> Cross Colors is American brands. We need to normalize these conversations at a Nietzsche, Mecca, academic oh platform. These were all American brands, the beginning of streetwear, and normalize that conversation so that urban can be for anybody. Like Supreme can be urban. They follow all the same logic. They're doing all the same things. So why is it? We need to normalize that. Right, right. I mean, the irony is that the CD of... Um, Supreme was one of the founders of PNB. There we go. And there Weird. We go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You could have your own show with all the knowledge. <laughs> yes, you could. You totally could. Um, I was thinking about something you said I, I, that's really frustrating. So I do a lot of bouldering and climbing. Um, well, not climbing. I do bouldering. Uh, I'm new at it. But I wanted to do an outdoor brand and I was talking to somebody and they're like, oh, so it'd be like an outdoor brand with an urban twist. And I was like, why? <laughs> why, why can't it just be a fucking outdoor brand? Because like, you're brown, dude. You're black. Yeah. So automatically out of the gates, it was just like, oh. Wow. Um, so the people left. So even now. Stop saying that shit. It's microaggressive. Um, even now, I can't, you know, it's like, 
right. Guess what? You can ask for a Bobby Joseph. Fuck them. Oh, I'm, and I'm we're not, going it's to not stopping me. It's just ironic conversation of two weeks ago. Yeah, but I have a sweatshirt that literally has a huge emblazed rhinestone urban on it. Fuck what you heard. <laughs> urban is dope. Like, I give a fuck. You want to make it bad? I'm going to normalize it as amazing. And I'm going to put rhinestones on it because guess what? Everybody loves a rhinestone. I do. <laughs> no. Vitma did their logo in a rhinestone and I was looking at that like if I had done that I would be like oh my god it's so er they do it it's so luxury it's so amazing bitch it was from 1990 that's all I did logos with rhinestones I remember that era I mean you couldn't not put a rhinestone on it I used to go mad anyway, sorry ranted again <laughs> so coming out now, Simone. I mean, but when he said that, that's so frustrating. Why is it? We're going to normalize urban to just be streetwear. We, it, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just. I don't know. I have to think about this now. I'll be bothering all of you. All right, you guys. I have to. I have to go. They're about to push me out of the, the museum. So. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone that checked in. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you for putting this together, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.